Their callers on the call. It helps you to come up with a story that you know you can stand by while you are at the same time still trying to make it as engaging and, um, you know, exciting as possible. Um, finally, when you have these scholarly advisors, it's also important to know when that you can just ignore them because they don't agree with one another. And that is actually something very helpful to know is that, you know, especially if you're taking on a subject where there are differences of opinion. People have written different things about it. They're different, but they encourage you to ignore your school advisors as well. Um, they do often tend to tell you things like, well, you have to mention this detail or that detail. And so without, uh, if you, the more that you've sort of defined the story for yourself and that you've checked it out and that you know what you're saying is absolutely accurate, then you should feel free to ignore their desire to, you know, keep things in that you know don't, aren't necessary. So I hope this is making sense. I'm kind of, I feel like I'm speaking around things a little bit. Um, the other thing about the story, as you approach a series, which is a little bit different than when you do a film, is that there's two things you want to think about as you're doing a series on a subject like this. You want to think of the narrative arc of the entire series. If it's one, if your series is about one topic and you're breaking it down into episodes, it should be very important that that whole that series feels like a whole piece. That you don't, you will hopefully encourage people to watch want to see the whole thing so that they don't miss a part of the story. Um, so think about it as you design your episodes or as you think about what parts of the story go into which episode. What is it that's going to give an overall arc so that you really feel like you begin somewhere, you take a journey, you learn something, something happens and you get to the end. Just like anything else, it's just like a feature film or any other kind of story thing is that if you have a very compelling narrative arc to your entire series, people will want to watch the other episodes. On the other hand, you know, it's also true that some people might only watch one, so it's also important that each episode feels satisfying on its own, that it also has this beginning, middle, and end, that it goes somewhere, that, you know, there's an arc to the story that you're telling in each episode. Um, if you're telling a story that's told in multiple parts that's, that are broken up in episodes, one of the things that you can be thinking about is how will you link the episodes? How will you make it so that you can drive people, viewers, to come back and watch the next episode, um, understand what happened if they didn't see the earlier episodes, and so forth. Um, so these are, you know, as, as you're designing each episode, you should be thinking very much about those linking parts, the, the end of one and the beginning of the one that follows, and so forth. When do you need to retell something you told in an earlier episode? It's important to do enough of that so that people can also watch a single episode and feel like they got something out of it. So that's something, um, sort of knowing when to do a little recap or when to repeat things that you've done earlier can also be um, an important way to make the whole series both uh, good in each episode and good overall. And then, of course, within each episode, you'll have stories or parts of stories or events or things. And so each of those two, you know, making those as dramatic, thinking about the best way to tell the story, not thinking of it as information, but when you get into trying to create the, the shape of the episode, thinking of each story as having a, a compelling beginning, middle, and end, and a, and a place where it's going, that you think about both in the sort of small parts of each episode, in the episode, as a whole and as in the series as a whole. Another thing that you'll want to think about as you're approaching your subject is um, what is your angle? How, what is your approach to the subject? Um, and why do you need to tell it in this way? Um, this includes not just sort of the, some of the content things I've been talking about, but also um, you know, you're, you're directing style, your filmic approach, you know, are you going to be telling this story through, you know, are you going to have experts speaking? Are you going to have just surviving, you know, eyewitnesses, participants in that history? Are you going to use archival narration? I mean, no, thinking about your angle is another way that you'll, it will, it will affect your story selection, it will affect the way you tell it, and um, it will also allow you to make choices between these different things. 
Um, if I'm rambling on, you should just break in. Because <laughs> she didn't tell me. So, so, so she... Uh, no, no, I think people are just listening for now. Uh, but feel free again, guys, to type okay. in your questions on that screen on the lower yeah, right hand. Yeah, feel free. Um, so another thing that, you know, in order to make it feel, you know, like a, like a multi-part series and not like a, you know, sort of individual little episodes that are unconnected to one another, you know, you want to, once you've defined your approach and you've thought about the things that are going to help you to stick to that approach, um, you know, one of the things that you'll be thinking about is are you going to use that across the whole series? And that sometimes is impossible. In the case of many rivers across, it wasn't possible to have the same approach throughout because we were starting in an era that had absolutely virtually no archival material and only, you know, contested accounts. And so you had to rely on scholars. As you go to the later episodes, there's quite a lot of archival material. So in that case, the approach, you know, we, we finally just said, okay, well, it's going to be sticking to stories that are about people, but we couldn't have a stylistic um, consistency across. So the thing is that if you define an approach and you know that's the approach you want to use, you have to know that sometimes you just need to break the rules that you've made in order to make the series work the best. But it, it's very good if you, if you know where, how you want to do it and you try to apply that approach to the whole thing. And then when you see that you're breaking rules, you know why you're doing them, and that will strengthen your piece. Um, the next thing I want to talk about was characters. Um, it's so obvious, but it's true that you know people are interested in people. And so if there's a way you can tell your story so that the characters in it, whether the characters are you know people from history or whether they're people who are talking about those people from history, it's really important that your audience engages with them, becomes interested in them, and um, you know cares enough to follow them. And that's one of the things that's going to help you to tell a large story, to, to, to create programs that cover like multiple episodes, is that if the people are very compelling, people will come back to them. And even if you, your story is very compelling, if you have, I mean, this is just sort of obvious for any filmmaker knows this, but if the story is very interesting, but the person that you have on camera is not interesting or compelling, it can be very, it, it, it's very difficult to convey the story that you want to tell. So obviously, both in sort of choosing the stories that you're going to tell that come from history and the stories and the people who are going to tell them on screen, those two things are both very important. Is you've got to make the people be as compelling as possible. And Leslie, we had an interjection and, you know, here. Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we have okay. an interjection from Nellie who wanted to know if you could take a bit of a step back and if you had any examples of any angles uh, or approaches that you considered utilizing for many rivers but decided uh, against. Um, or, or the different angles that you uh, considered before you picked one. Well, I think that what happened there was that we started with this large board of advisors and mountains of information and all, you know, with uh, Professor Gates was the executive producer. He wanted us to go to the um, scholars and ask them what they thought were the most important stories. And that was where I learned the lesson that if you ask the scholars, they will tell you their, um, their specialty, and so I ended up with this mountain of stories that didn't connect, and it was just absolutely, it would have been whizzing by at the speed of light with, you know, a blip here and a blip there, and, and the decision was, well, no, we have to spend time with some of these stories, or people won't connect to the history. They won't, they think, okay, Frederick Douglass, I know we just forget it, but you had to actually bring them in to remind them why Frederick Douglass was so amazing. Mm rather than cram cramming in the 30 other people that historians of the era thought should be included. And so it meant making some painful choices, but it also meant that I think in the end, you know, some of those stories come across because they we spend a little time on them. And that brings back to the character thing, is that, for instance, when you're talking, you know, when you're bringing in the character and you're telling a story that's nonfiction, a lot of times the temptation is to think, well, they must be conveying important information at all times. But in fact, just again, like with any film, I mean, whether it's, you know, 
informational or whether it's fiction, there, in order to understand why that, to, to connect with the character, there's times that you have to have material in there that takes up time on screen, but that just connects you just with the humanity of the person, where you have a chance to have something that's funny or just a small detail. These are the things that help you to tell your story better if, if people feel connected to the characters. Um, and sometimes that can be really hard. Like I said, when you're talking about characters that are in the distant past, it really can be very alienating. Some of the ones, like I said, from many rivers to cross, there are some people that people have heard about in school for so many years. You know, how do you remind people that Rose Parks was amazing? She's just not, she's not just this cliche that's pulled out in, you know, February every year. People say, yes, you know, we're going to salute Rosa Parks. She, to actually understand who she was, we had to think about what are the things that people today can relate to? What are the things about, you know, Frederick Douglass that, you know, when you realize what it would be like to see somebody like Douglas today, how compelling he was, how fierce and courageous and, you know, how shocking it was for his era, the things that he did, then it really brings it home. If you can find ways to connect with your contemporary audience, that helps you to bring these, you know, long lost figures to life. Um, so I talked a little bit about audience to, um, it's important to know as you approach a subject like this, you know, who is your intended audience? You know, is it for television? You know, that is something that, you know, you, for instance, in the case of the Many Rivers to Cross, everyone always tells us, and I know I'm sure it's probably true for the most part, that, that PBS audience is you know, predominantly white, predominantly over the age of 60. So, you know, we knew that was probably the audience we could start with, but we wanted that audience to reach, we wanted to reach other people. We wanted to reach um, younger people that don't usually watch PBS. We wanted to re reach a more diverse audience because we felt like, even though in a way it seems like something people have seen before, we know that that audience hadn't yet heard the story told in a way like this from beginning to end. And to say, you know, this deserves to be heard again, even though you know a lot of it or you know some of it. And so that was an important thing, too, was trying to decide how do you, you know, while trying to reach the audience that you know is sort of the PBS audience and the audience that comes to watch Professor Gates's work, how do you also try to reach a little bit beyond that? And how do you give them both the things that they want to see and, and, and also maybe offer something to somebody else? Um, in this case, we knew that, you know, there were times that there were people there were people who were going to tune into this who already knew everything about the civil rights movement, and so to explain again what happened at Selma or what happened in Montgomery, you know, these were things that the choices had to be made. How how do we both tell it so that somebody who's not that familiar with it learns it, and also make it so that the person who knows the history well feels like they are getting a new insight, they're getting to see something that they hadn't seen before that makes it worthwhile. It gets it into the larger story, even if it's only that. Um, it's just reminding yourself that even the, the, even the information that may be familiar to your audience can still be told in a way that they've never seen before. Um, and then finally, I just want to talk about the life after broadcast, like I said. I mean, one of the things that's nice about doing is see series. I mean, this can be true of single films as well, but with a series, it, it, you know, I think people have more of a habit now of doing that, like watching an entire series and watching it when it's not on television. You know, that's something that is actually an exciting new possibility that I'm sure you guys are learning about more in some of these other webinars, um, sort of the, the not for broadcast uses of these kinds of programs. And, um, you know, for in the case of Many Verbs to Crosses, pretty excited just like a few weeks ago my uh, my sister told me that my nephew is in eighth grade and he's studying slavery in school in San Diego and he had of course watched the whole many rivers to cross when it was on but he was very excited because they're actually using it in the classroom and the kids were watching it and he felt you know excited that it was on but I was even more excited I think because I realized that you know once it was broadcast last fall I was happy about it but I also wasn't really sure who else was seeing it, but to get these little stories back that people are using it 
that they're watching it, that it's actually useful in, a, in the context of the classroom, that is something that um, is great to know. And I'm glad that, you know, that those, there were choices that we made, because we were aware of that, that um, made it so that it, it can be more evergreen. So we try not to be too tied to the moment of when it was going to be broadcast, but to think about, you know, if we're telling the story as a story, we're also telling it as something that can be looked at again later that will preserve a moment. I mean, the thing with history, which is very bizarre, is that it seems like, well, it's in the past, so it already, you know, what happened is already set. In fact, the way we tell the history changes all the time. The way that people talked about the civil rights movement in, you know, 1970 would have been a lot different than the way we talk about it today, where we can say, well, you know, what happened? You know, we had all this great legislation that was supposed to make racial equality happen. We have mass incarceration today. And so looking at the history, you know, you're making it a, for the moment that you're in, but you're also making it so that it can live on later. And that while you're telling the story that happened long ago, you're also telling a story that is, you're, you're telling it in the way that we're looking at it now, which also will become historical <laughs> finally when people reinterpret things and look at things again later um, so that uh, was pretty much the end of my presentation I would be happy to answer questions uh, anybody else has if there are any hmm. We have one question uh, from Darkling Productions, uh, Leslie, about the the success of this series. So how, yeah, how how much of the success is due to the prominent host? I guess that's for the audience to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I guess in that question is this idea that um, if you're going to tell a history story, do you need do you need a celebrity host? I can tell you that you know the. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, what I was going to say is I think certainly um, that the um, there are certainly people who tune in for the host because they see his other programs, and so that's certainly a factor for the viewers. Um, you know, we worked with that at, as we prepared the treatments because, you know, we knew that he would be – the one leading us on the journey and so we you know there were ways that we could but you know if it had been done without a host it would have been done in a different way so i don't really know if that answers your question oh are you looking for a famous person to lead it no i mean i think that hosted series is one kind of thing um series without a host work fantastically well too it really depends on your subject and your approach i don't think you need to have a host to get it to get people to watch um, I see another question here that says, uh, how long did it take to put the project together? From the time that I started with the quality advisors, I would say it was about two years, but it was pretty intense, two years. And production was about a year and a half. So for six months, was probably, you know, developing the treatments. Um, uh, there's a question here too, Leslie, about some specifics around marketing to an educational audience. Um, did you have you heard anything about that in terms of how you guys handled that? You know, I I have to say that I did not participate in that part. I, I um you know my role was working on the series itself, and it was WNET and PBS that handled the um, dealing with the educational audience. I'm sorry, I can't. Really help you with that. Um, uh, so I also, I'm sorry, I can't really answer how they marketed it to attract younger viewers. I mean, I think that, you know, just from watching, monitoring kind of social media and so forth, it was interesting to see how, I mean, the people that we dealt with at PBS were actually surprised by the demographics of the audience. I was not because I felt that, you know, I think that it's not that, you know, people of color are not watching PBS because they don't like PBS. It's because there isn't programming for them. And so if there's more programs, of course people will tune in. I don't think it's surprising that, you know, once people realize, oh, this is something that might be, you know, 
worthwhile. I mean, one thing that was interesting, even from, from some of the professors and historians that we use, is that they watched it with their kids. I mean, I watched it with my kids. It's a thing where, you know, it's it's a nice opportunity to have a, you know, something that people can watch together. So I, I don't know whether they specifically tried to bring in the younger viewers, but I know that they had a more diverse and younger audience than they usually have for that series. And they were very happy about it, but like I said, I don't think it's a mystery. I think if you make it visible and you make programming that people want to see, which hopefully you guys are all going to do, then people will come and watch it. Um, I'm just moving on to the questions here. I see that uh, question, how do you prioritize which of the four drives the project? Um, I, I think it really depends on your project. I think in this case, it was really story that came first and then characters. And then, you know, our audience was a little bit built in because we had, um, you know, when I came on the project, it was the, the funding had already been raised, so I was not involved in the fundraising. I was just trying to make it into something that people would want to watch, so try to make stories out of it. So I would say that for, certainly for my role as a senior story producer, I, my first thought was, like, how do you make this story compelling? Like, this history is so amazing, but how can I convey that to the audience? And one of the ways to do that was then with the characters. So I would say in, in this particular case, it was first the story, then the characters, the approach came out of that. And then, you know, the audience was less of a concern. I think it depends on the subject you're doing, though, because I think that there are certain historical subjects where you know it's going to appeal to a certain audience, and so you would build out from there, for instance. But in our, in our case, it would have come up with that. I seem to have just lost my window of the meeting. Sorry, I was just <clears throat> switching presenters just so I give people a sense of the upcoming webinars as well. Uh, and for okay, those who great. have more sort of marketing questions, you'll definitely have a chance to ask those uh, on our next webinar on the 22nd with uh, Denise Davis, who promoted the Awkward Black Girls web series. Uh, they got about something like 13 million views right. on their YouTube. So she will definitely have some information for us about how to gather the right audience and how to find and market to them specifically. That's great. That's great. Um, I'm just looking at Carla's question here. It says, um, how important is it to determine the order on, or deciding the timeline of the project, time length of the project? Um, one thing that, you know, probably the people at NBC MBPC can tell you better than I can is, you know, are there, does PBS kind of let you know that there's certain lengths that are the mo that are more fundable, that are more easy to get viewers for? I mean, in the case of uh, Many Rivers to Cross, we knew it was going to be, well, it, it was the initial plan when they tried to raise the money was to make it 10 hours, and they did not raise enough money, so we made six hours, but that was kind of a given, and so it was sort of fitting it into the six hours was the task at hand. I think when you're at the point of conceptualizing it and thinking about it, I mean, I think you should think about both, um, you know, it kind of depends on what your subject is. You should definitely consult with the people at NBC and see because some stories, you know, people will come back and watch six hours. Some people, some stories might maybe they're better to tell in four hours. It also kind of depends how you break it down. You know, obviously funding is always a factor. Um, I think that there may be some lengths. Do you know, Christian, whether there's some lengths that are more easy to get on TV or more engaging for audience? You might know that better than me. Well, we found that in the past, a lot of content that ends up in our Afropop series really is more easily programmed in the one hour range, which is about 56 minutes. Uh, and I think the reason for that is that a lot of programmers um, just don't have enough programming, for example, that fits within the 30 minute window. So if they were to take something that was 90 minutes for example, it'd be difficult for them to find something that was a 30 minute right. add on after that one uh, 90 minutes. Um, but an hour on average is what we seem to be the most easily successful to pitch to programmers, at least within the PBS system. And of course, when you get online, those rules completely change. <laughs> Um, I hear Lena has a question specific about um, cliffhangers into the series. I mean, I, I guess if you look at many rivers, they're not exactly cliffhangers, but there were things that um, 
you know, as I was sort of trying to crunch these things down into scripts, going from the history into scripts, and I had sort of written out this list of stories, there were certain things that I would think, ah, that's really, a, that's really a, you know, kind of sums up this moment that we just have, will have been talking about and turns to something else. For instance, you know, it was very important to, to me when we were kind of covering the whole Jim Crow era and really building the idea that there were these separate worlds, not just separate worlds where, you know, oh, wasn't it miserable for African Americans? It was. It was terrible. But it was also that they had their dignity. They built their own worlds. They really, within the parameters that were forced upon them, they, they, they built all kinds of amazing culture and art and history happened. And so it was very important you know, the fact that people had either the theme of that episode, and which was going to lead into the fifth episode, which had the civil rights movement, it was very important to sort of cap that era of segregation with the Green Book, because I felt like the Green Book was a perfect example of how people had said, okay, we're not going to let this segregation, you know, keep us from traveling, having lives, you know, living with dignity. And so the Green Book, to me, was sort of summed it up, but it also set up the idea, the absurdity that there had to be this kind of separate guidebook for African Americans to travel through the segregated world was set up for, you know, the what, what was to come, which was the civil rights movement, where people would just stand up and not take it anymore. And so that was actually very, you know, that's a good example of one where, you know, I, I held on to that from the earliest phases of the treatment writing through the end because I knew that was something that would help us you know, turn from one thing to another. Um, I'm just reading this. When writing the treatment, did you just like the Jefferson? Um, I wrote them out. I wrote them out in detail. It was very helpful to do it. And of course, once the directors came in, we worked together. There was, um, you know, some of the things changed from the treatment as they went from treatment to script to show. That always happens in <laughs> documentary. But, you know, it was a pretty detailed, like, I would say 12 to 15 page treatment for each episode before the directors came on. One more question from Usame. Yeah, I was not involved with the funding, no. I came on, it was already funded. Uh, and I guess one question that I did have was, if what do you think is helpful for Beyond Men and Rivers, which is a great series, obviously, that's why we got you on here, but what, what should people be immersing themselves when, when they're doing their historical research? Because I feel like maybe sometimes when you get to know a, a new subject matter that's historical, you sort of maybe overdo it by focusing just on that specific thing. Is there something that helped you take your mind off and even inspire the main story as you were writing your, your different treatments for each episode? Well, I mean, what, you know, like I said, I'm not a historian and I'm not an expert in history at all. And so, you know, one thing that I did bring, which I think is actually that we bring it, you know, there's a reason why filmmakers are making these films and not historians is that, you know, you bring to it all of the same, you know, ideas that you bring to any story to tell and it has to be engaging. So I think that if you bring your filmic sensibility to the history, you know, you can make it into something that many, many more people will actually appreciate. And that is it's a great thing to do because, you know, you discover this history and you think, wow, this is amazing. These historians know about it it's just sitting here in these books, but, you know, it's, it's by bringing it to television that you actually get it to this audience that then, you know, for instance, like my nephew and his class, you know, they were very excited to talk about that stuff. And, you know, it was, it was a privilege to be able to have worked on that and gotten it in there. So I feel like, you know, they're not just reading a textbook that misrepresents <laughs> history or, you know, tells it in a way that doesn't engage with kids. So. Um, yeah, that's, it's just using the same, you know, it still has to be worth watching. It has to be as exciting to watch as a, as a you know, a sitcom or a 
scandal or something. <laughs> it, it isn't that exciting, but you know what I mean. Uh, I see a question, how did you gain your experience? Um, I actually had worked, uh, I've been a producer director for many, many years, and so doing, uh, working as a senior story producer was new for me on that. It was the second time I did it. Before that, I had worked with um, Professor Gates on these genealogy series for various rounds, so I had worked on that as well. But I did not have, um, you know, history experience, per se. Um, then there's a question about whether the series exists in a shorter format. Um, you know, I don't know. I think it's, I think that, for instance, in the case of the educational, which was handled by PBS, I know that what my nephew was watching, it was definitely not um, the whole programs in the class, but they were doing it in segments, and that was something that the educational department of PBS did. But I think that, um, you know, if you're, you know, starting your series now and you're thinking about those uses from the very beginning, I know from some of these other webinars you can be thinking about that, you know, as you go into it. It's something that could be have shorter pieces of work. That's something that we want to think of. I have the opportunity to do it now, I would like to think about that because I think a lot of times that is what people watch, you know, especially younger people, that the the chance that people have time to sit down and watch a whole hour beyond the broadcast is less and less. And so if you can make it be thinking already how you can also make shorter pieces that are available, I think it's great. Uh, yes, once programs are completed, PBS Learning Media does work with producers to segment the content, particularly for educational use. Uh, but Leslie, I think you're, you're very right in that, particularly if your story has a world of other small stories within it, uh, I think it is a smart idea to be able to think of ways to almost make webisodes out of your whole series uh, so that at the mm -hmm. end of the day, instead of just like 30 second promos, your series can have scenes that are that act as promotion for the larger broadcast. Um, let's see, there's a you know, budget question. Um, again, I, as I mentioned, I, I didn't work on the, the fundraising. I also was not in charge of the budget. I um, I know that the, the fundraising was one large amount that came from various funders, and then it was distributed through the layers of WSET and executive producers and so forth. But I was only aware of the part that we got to actually do the production, which did not include the host fee or anything like that. That was all above my head. Um, you know, so all we knew were the constraints of what we had to make with six hours, not including executives or PBS stations or hosts or anything. <laughs> You're the top of the line stuff. Way above the line. I don't know if you guys are doing a budgeting webinar, but that might be helpful. I think that's a big part to when you think about, you know, I mean, one of the things that just from the, the part of the budget that I was working with, um, which was production and post production and the things, was, um, you know, in some ways doing six hour, you know, a six hour series is probably costs less than doing six individual one hour films just because there are things that are in common. Um, but it is, you know, it's a, it's a much larger, but like if I had had to raise the funding myself, I mean, I could, I could never have done it. It's a large amount of money that um, to come up with at once. But I will say that, you know, if you, if you budgeted for single films, one of the nice things about the series, you know, I can say that I know that, you know, there were things, for instance, like if we had a composer, we didn't pay him as you would pay a composer for six individual one-hour films. We paid him a few for the series, and then, you know, there were themes that came back. So I think the same works, you know, with, with archival, we got sometimes, you know, a blanket deal from certain archival houses where they would give us, because they saw that we had so many hours that we were going to be using X number, so they would give us a reduced rate and stuff. So I think that, you know, doing a budgeting seminar for a multi-part thing might actually be helpful, because I think it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. 
Makes sense. So we have time for a couple more questions, guys, if you uh, if you can think of some. Uh, and we will ask Leslie maybe two more questions. I'm curious what subjects you guys are going to propose, but I guess I'm not allowed to ask the question. <laughs> Um, no, I think I'm excited I, that there's yeah. going to be these new series. I'm very, very excited to see what people are going to do. And we, more people right. are doing more subjects like this. Yes, we are too. We we definitely know that there's tons of ideas out there, and we just want to make.